remember usually. Um, but uh, hello, everyone. Yep, I'm the uh, one of the founders of uh, Drive Time. Uh, we are the world's first uh, developer of games for specifically for the driver of the car. Um, and obviously using uh, speech recognition technologies to allow you to, to play games uh, while you drive, which is our tagline, play games while you drive, uh, using just your voice. Uh, our, our kind of grand vision, if you will, is to be uh, similar to SiriusXM, if you're familiar with SiriusXM in the UK, uh, which is you know, digital satellite radio. Um, their focus is squarely on the driver of the car or, or the car in general. Um, and you know they offer about 150 different channels, uh, you know, ranging from from music to entertainment to politics to sports uh, to shock jocks like Howard Stern. Um, our vision is very similar to that, which is basically, hey, we want to be the interactive version of, of SiriusXM. Uh, so our our first channel, as we're calling it, uh, is a general knowledge trivia game, uh, which is uh, produced five days a week, uh, Monday through Friday. It's specifically for your commute. Um, and so we're kind of optimizing the experience and the timing and the pacing uh, of that of that show uh, to kind of match the the pacing of your daily commute uh, in the United States. There are a lot of people who drive to and from work by themselves, 110 million to be precise, out of 150 million uh, working age or working Americans. Um, and so we've we've decided that we want to offer these people. This is our our first kind of uh, target market is this 110 million uh, commuters who drive to and from work every day. Um, I want this to be as, as interesting for you guys as possible. So I'm probably only going to talk for a few more minutes because because what we're doing is actually fairly self-explanatory. <laughs> it is literally as voice games for the driver. Um, but I just want to touch on a couple of quick points before uh, before I you know hand it over to questions for you guys. Um, the kind of the, the the genesis of of drive time. Uh, so the founding team, uh, we're all, uh, you know, game developers. We've been working in games for a long time. Uh, we were early at Zynga back in the day when uh, Zynga was building on top of MySpace even, uh, and then of course onto Facebook. Um, and then we, the, the three founders of the company of drive time, were also founders of this uh, mobile gaming company previously. So we've been, we've been making games, um, for, good number of years now and one of the things that we we've learned and internalized along the way is that whenever there's a new platform uh, and by platform i mean a new way of um communicating with technology and a new way of communicating with other human beings using that technology whenever there's a new platform that emerges um and that platform kind of reaches a, a critical mass um gaming and interactive entertainment is always one of the first things to emerge as a use case uh, and oftentimes becomes one of the biggest or if not the biggest um, kind of value driver if you will so if you look at the uh, app stores you know google play and uh, apple um, more than two-thirds of the revenue globally is gaming you know you got your supercells and your king.coms and you know all the play tickets for for you know slots and, and casino stuff um, a lot of value is generated um, from gaming from entertainment same thing happened with Zynga you know Zynga was building on top of social networks as a platform uh, and you know was able to generate a huge amount of, of value and, and excitement um, by offering games um, you know a portfolio of games our approach is really no different to that you know we're not um, what we're innovating on is is kind of the offering for the driver for the, the use case but what we're doing is following we think we hope in the footsteps uh, of a tried and true um approach which is when a new platform emerges and in this case it's interactive voice um or chat bots you know lots of different names are, are are used but i call it interactive voice interactive voice is a platform in and of itself it's a new way of communicating with technology and it's a new way of communicating with other human beings um, we believe that gaming and interactive entertainment is going to emerge as a, as a big kind of driver of value and uh, time. Um, so that's, that's the reason we're doing what we're doing. Um, you know, we think there's, there's opportunity there. Um, the idea actually came from, I moved from San Francisco to the East Bay here in the Bay Area. I live in, uh, in Oakland. And so I, I went from walking and, and biking to work every day to you know, once our second child was born, uh, to driving, I became one of those drivers. Uh, and my own personal hell is the Bay Bridge, um, which has a toll plaza, uh, which is massively congested every day. Uh, and you're just sitting there for 20, 30, 40 minutes sometimes for no good reason. And one of the things I observed, you know, looking around the other drivers who are just sitting in their cars is, you know, everyone's bored. Everyone's bored out of their minds. 
Um, and you know, they're, they're fiddling with their phones and they're browsing Facebook and they're, you know, sending text messages and you really shouldn't be, that's dangerous. That's distracted driving. Uh, even if you're going slowly and, and you know, even if you're standing still pretty much. Um, so, you know, the idea for, Hey, wouldn't it be great if you could play games while you drive, be interactive in a safe uh, manner in a way that has been designed for, for the, for the driver. Um, that's really where, where this, this, this idea came from. Um, and obviously the massive push, uh, you know, the smart speaker in the home, you know, the Amazon echo and Google assistant, Google home. Um, that was kind of the second piece of the puzzle that had to fall into place where, you know, consumer awareness has been built uh, by the big tech giants. Uh, you know, a small startup such as ourselves, we're only 11 people. Um, you know, we can't, create that consumer awareness and consumer acceptance of these new technologies. Uh, so we are, you know, eternally grateful for Amazon and, and Google and you know, to a lesser degree, Apple and Microsoft with Cortana um, for creating this awareness uh, for these new technologies, for this new way of interacting. And we're basically riding the coattails, you know, riding on the wave um, of, of, of what they've done. So that's that's kind of the genesis story we founded the company in 2018 we spent the first six months of the year uh, essentially proving out the technology making sure that we could actually do this you know technically speaking uh, we use google's uh, speech apis which are available um you know in the cloud we uh, do the recognition in real time uh, over cellular data connections uh, that was not by no means was it obvious that that was going to be possible that those connections were going to be fast enough um, uh, but basically spent the first six months kind of overcoming some technical issues and some hurdles. Um, and then this summer we were ready to just soft launch. Uh, we launched in uh, initially a private beta in the United States with just friends and family. Uh, that went really well. We then soft launched in Canada uh, at the end of September and that went, continued to go well. And so we've now just publicly launched uh, October 29th. So we've been alive in the United States, which is our primary market target market. Uh, again, those 110 million, daily commuters who drive to and from work every day by themselves um, for, for about a month. Um, not live in the UK yet, so you can't get us, uh, get drive time in the UK app store. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna pause there. Uh, it's about, I think about 10 minutes there. Um, if there's anything I didn't touch on, I'd love to, to kind of open it up to questions and just talk about what you, you guys are interested in um, over there in, in the UK. Questions, no one got questions? All right, I'm just going to run down the back and maybe take the microphone that works. And, and I hope you ask about safety because I'm very prepared to have that conversation. <laughs> yeah, that's my question. I'm curious about how you handle safety. Exactly. So I'm glad that that was the first question. Um, so safety is, is our primary focus. Obviously, there's, you know, from an ethical perspective, but also from a PR perspective, it would be an absolute nightmare, you know, if, if we were actually, you know, shown to be dangerous. So uh, one of the, the very first things we did was dive into the research around distracted driving um, and, you know, took what so we fundamentally believe that what we're doing is actually safer um, than what's currently happening in the car. Uh, distracted driving is very real. It's very dangerous. And it's, it's the cause of about, I think, uh, distracted, specific distracted driving is the cause of at least a quarter to a third, depending on what studies you look at, accidents um, that, that happen. Um, so, and a lot of that distraction comes from, you know, people looking at their screen, uh, a text message comes in, they're like, oh, I'm going to respond to that. Um, and taking your eyes off the road. That's absolutely the, the most dangerous piece there. And there's a lot of research around this, obviously, um, from a variety of you know, universities and from governments and agencies. So there's actually a wealth of data that we can, we can look at. And one of, the, one of the kind of counterintuitive studies, um, or perhaps instinctively counterintuitive um, kind of concept is that having the right level of interactivity that's not distracting you from your driving, but is keeping you alert um, is actually safer than um, not having anything, which is, you know, you, you get bored, you get kind of doze off, uh, and it makes you more prone to looking at your, your mobile device in the car when a text message comes in or, or whatever. So um, there's, there's a couple of studies that I always cite, uh, fairly recent studies, 2008 and 2009. One is a Stanford study, the other one is a Ben Gurion University study out of uh, Israel. And they, they have basically tested these things called alertness maintaining tasks, AMTs. And those, uh, and the Ben Gurion one in particular, tested trivia. 
So it's actually very relevant to, to what we're doing. And it found that having uh, the right level of interactivity, AMTs, these alertness maintaining tasks, actually made the driving safer every single time. Uh, and these tests have been repeated multiple times over by, by other people. Um, so what we're doing is, again, we believe we're on the right side of the safety argument. We have the research to support it. Um, and we're actually looking to partner with a, with a local university here. I can't uh, say who because we haven't made it public yet, but, but their view is that we're likely double dipping into safety, partly because of the AMTs, the alertness maintaining tasks and the, and the benefits that you get from that. But then also because you're actually uh, not just staying alert for longer, but you're actually, because you're interactive in a safe way, you're not doing the dangerous interactivity, which is the, you know, touching the screen and, and tapping your text messages and what have you. So, um, Slightly rambling answer, but but really, safety is by far our biggest concern. Um, the research suggests um, and and supports um, that what we're doing is actually safer than than you know not having this. Um, and then finally, uh, every piece of the design of the experience is very much with the driver in mind. Um, so most mobile gaming experiences, if you say like I'm making a, a mobile game, you know there is some visual component to it. With ours, there isn't. It's actually designed to be played behind your mapping app. So everything works completely in the background. Uh, and it's just like having a conversation um, or listening to a podcast um, you know, while, you're, while you're driving. So I'll pause there. And I, I hope I touched on the points that, that were, were critical there. But uh, yeah, safety is, is you know, obviously the number one concern. Um, can I ask a follow-up on the safety? Uh, just quickly, uh, how can you start the game? Uh, yeah, yep. Uh, so that's a great question. So the answer is no, you cannot yet. Um, we we're we're not like uh, you know Amazon Echo or a Google Assistant where we're listening the whole time. So we're only listening uh, and firing off the speech recognition uh, API calls to Google um, when it's time for you to answer the question. Um, now we have that on. It, uh, we're planning for that, but that's it's way more difficult to to do that than than what we've done. Uh, so what the what we've designed the experience to be as is basically there's a giant play button on the screen. That's the only thing that kind of you really have in the app is is basically a kind of a lobby and a big play button. Um, so the idea is you get into your car, you put your phone into to the mobile phone cradle, you press the play button, put your mapping up in the foreground, and then you you take off and drive. After that, you don't have to touch it at all. Uh, you can just play entirely using your voice, and you don't have to look at the app. You don't have to touch the app um, at all. Uh, so I'm just wondering, um, you, you talked about hitting the right kind of level of cognitive load, so so yeah. as to threaten safety. I'm wondering, uh, did you hit upon like quiz games or questions that were actually uh, too difficult or too distracting? Uh, so that's a that's a great question, and this is something that we're still you know honing in on. Uh, so one of the things um, you know they're on a scale of zero to a hundred on you know inter interactivity scale, um, you know where zero is you're listening to an audio book, you know, and a hundred is you're playing Call of Duty, you know, with with a controller. Um, we actually want to index somewhere like around ten or twenty. Um, you know, we don't want to be too interactive. We don't want to be too difficult. We don't want you to be having to think too hard about what's going on. And so uh, difficulty wise, you know, we're actually designing the experience. Yes, we have, a, so the, the format is uh, three quizzes, seven questions each. There's seven different trivia categories, you know, like, like you'd have in Trivial Pursuit. Um, and each question gets uh, progressively a little bit harder, but we are definitely indexing on the easier side because again, we want you to have fun. Uh, we don't necessarily, we don't have cash prizes. We're not like HQ trivia. We don't have cash prizes. We don't have any kind of um, big driver that needs to weed out people. Um, we're not knocking you out. We're basically designing this so that you can play the entire experience um, and, and not be knocked out. Um, so there is a little bit of, you know, comp competition that we have leaderboards that you can look at after you finish driving that are not accessible while you're moving. Um, you know, we have uh, a way for you to challenge your friends, uh, but, the, the balance of the game is designed to be less interactive uh, and less difficult, especially in this early phase where we're kind of, you know, testing the waters and making sure that we get that balance right. Thank you. Um, hi, Nico. Uh, are, you applying, are you planning or applying this technology to other formats like storytelling purposes? Because I'm assuming um, one of the biggest competition would be like podcasts. 
what I'm doing to manage the podcast box. Beautiful question, and I'm glad you asked that. Yes. So, um, uh, if anybody in that room there is familiar with Telltale Games, uh, which uh, sadly just closed and 250 people lost their jobs here, um, and their Walking Dead uh, storytelling, interactive storytelling um, app in particular, um, that is very much uh, our next set of channels. Um, so, we actually debated whether we launch with trivia or we launch with you know narrative storytelling. Um, and in the end, we decided trivia was kind of um, a, probably a broader um, market, just more people are familiar with the trivia format. Uh, but we actually think that interactive storytelling, you know, narrative fiction uh, has the potential to be an even more engaging uh, and, and almost better use case, certainly a longer term use case um, for, uh, for our, you know, the, the driver experience. So uh, literally our next channel uh, that we're launching, which is coming in Q1, is going to be uh, interactive storytelling. So essentially, like The Walking Dead by Telltale Games, uh, where you make choices, those choices have consequences, uh, you have branching narrative that takes you in different directions. Um, so essentially like, you know, audiobooks where you're, you're the star, you get to make the decisions. Uh, we actually foresee a whole suite of these, um, these types of channels where, you know, you have fantasy and horror and romance and, you know, kind of soap opera style. Uh, there's a lot, you know, as many genres of books and audiobooks as there are, uh, we see no reason to, um, that, you know, we can do the same thing with, with interactive storytelling. Um, and it's a great use case for the car as well, because you've got that, you know, the average commute in America is uh, one hour, so half an hour each way, uh, and commutes are getting longer, not shorter. So that's the perfect amount of time for you to kind of engage in a, uh, hopefully, an engaging uh, storytelling uh, experience where you get to make the decisions. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm asking about Google Speech API. Do you have to pay anything to Google for you? Yes, yes. So, um, the speech recognition, so we, one of the things that happened uh, in 2017, which, which I didn't really touch on is, you know, many people are asking like, why now? Uh, you know, why, why, is this, why hasn't this been done before? Partly it's, you know, the, uh, mostly it's technology and hasn't been, hasn't been available. Um, so Google's, Google made their, Google was the first actually to make their speech APIs, basic enterprise grade, near 100% accuracy, um, available in May of 2017 uh, via you know, API call. Um, there is a charge. Uh, and they're they all char and Microsoft and uh, uh, Amazon and you know lots of uh, IBM Watson. There's a lot of different offerings that all offer some variant of, of speech recognition, you know, via cloud uh, API. Um, the the charge is very minimal. Uh, I can't remember the exact number now, but it's a tiny fraction of a cent per um, instance. Uh, that's how they charge you. So for every instance that we open up to do. Um, do the speech recognition for, for the answers. Um, we pay a tiny fraction of a cent uh, to, to Google for that. Um, this, and at massive scale, the cost would be significant, um, not you know prohibitive, but, but significant. Um, we see this as very similar to um, you know, cloud computing, anything that's, you know, it's a race to the bottom on, on the cost. Uh, so uh, your answer was much more, I could have been much more succinct on my answer to your question, but. The answer is yes, there is a cost uh, associated with, with the speech recognition. Thank you. So uh, what's your monetization model? You mentioned social and mobile and sort of your, your waypoints. Uh, so how are people going to actually uh, pay for these things? Yep. So uh, there are a couple, uh, two kind of buckets that that uh, we we look at. Uh, bucket number one is is the kind of easy one, so to speak, uh, and it's advertising. Uh, radio advertising uh, in the United States is a twenty billion a year industry, and surprisingly recession proof. Surprisingly, continues to grow every year, a little bit faster than GDP. Um, and most of that radio advertising is generated in the car, and almost all of that. Um, is generated during the commute hours. The commute hours are the far the most valuable uh, times of day, uh, for the same reason that you know the Super Bowl or you know the World Cup finals are you know valuable time, uh, because that's when everybody's online. That's when they're alert. That's when they're kind of in the same mode. Um, so 
that's that's one bucket. Um, the bucket that we prefer uh, and we see as way more sustainable and, and in, in the long term certainly more valuable is a subscription based um, revenue model. Uh, Sirius XM charge, you know, they give you three months for free and then they start charging you um, kind of on a monthly basis with a you know, annual discount. Netflix, same deal. The idea is that we, so we can't do that initially because, you know, who's going to want to subscribe to a single channel trivia show, you know, half an hour a day. Um, but over time, as we're launching these new content channels, these new kind of concepts, new interactive experiences, um, what we'll likely end up doing is giving you, giving for each channel, giving you something for free, whether it's a single episode or, you know, you get the first season for free and then you have to start paying once you get to kind of, um, kind of that next level of content. So advertising one bucket, um, uh, subscription based businesses, second bucket. Sirius XM is a $35 billion company. Um, and they only have 18% market share, uh, in the, in the car in the United States. So it's a big, big market. Um, and, with the right offering, we, we believe we can we can uh, go subscription based as well. All right, thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, all. Thank you all. Um, so, Luca, Luca, unfortunately, you can't come to the pub with us because you're not here. Oh. So you tell everyone your Twitter handles so they can uh, send any further questions to you. Yeah, so I'm uh, at Nico the Finn. Uh, I'm not a massive tweeter, but uh, I have re, re resurrected it uh, as part of this. So yeah, Nico the Finn uh, is my is my Twitter handle, and Drive Time underscore FM is our company handle. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure you'd have an awful lot of willing beta testers uh, here when you do what to watch in the UK. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, we definitely have have plans to do that, and we've already secured the Drive Time app name in the UK App Store. So we have we have plans to be there. Uh, UK has much. By the way, just out of just between us. The UK has much stricter distracted driving laws. Um, and so, again, we know we're on the right side of the safety argument, um, but the UK is very, uh, has. No. <laughs> Canada and Australia, not so much. <laughs> cool. All right. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Nico. Uh, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you all. Bye bye. <laughs> Okay.